So the process is this. Um, uh, Wendy's going to get up and present for a while. Uh, Neil will then follow and morph into Q&A. And he'll just give me a hint, he says, when the Q&A starts, because he's actually going to ask a few questions of Wendy first. So it's the primary care doc and the accidental entrepreneur. Well, good morning, and thank you. So just get in here. Um, I'm very uh, honored to be here today, and I want to thank Anton, Anton and Neil, and also uh, Bill Pascal, Stephen Dreiser, and my team to help me uh, put together this presentation. We have had many iterations of it, so I'm now going to speed date with you with a very uh, few slides to get a flavor of where I think our discussions may go today. And uh, really, I think what I'm talking about is an extension of primary care reform to some extent, taking in some of the global influences that we've seen. When I sat not too far away, and I'll mumble 1982, and graduated from the University of Toronto, we were told quite confidently that we didn't need to treat people over 65. Don't worry about it when we discuss kidney failure. Don't worry about it when we discussed infectious disease. And probably the most dramatic alteration to my life as a family practitioner and hospitalist in rural northern Ontario has been the fact that I'm stopping Lipitor, considering stopping Lipitor in my aging population of 85 that live independently in assisted living. It is the biggest part, the most gratifying part of my practice, and has completely changed how I've looked at things. And so when Forbes magazine says this is the year of digital health patient engagement, we have to really think of bimodal populations, really those that we begin to treat in acute care and those that are living longer with a completely different bent on life. And I hope that I'm as vital as that gentleman uh, towards the end of my life. My parents certainly are. My dad's leaving for India today at age 86. So the trends that we're seeing in healthcare certainly are uh, using technologies in other countries to bridge gaps and understandings. I'll speak to that in, in dementia. Empowering patients using smartphones, and this has really had a big uptake in the aging population that we would say over 65 and 70, and more data. We heard this morning on CBC, for those of you driving in, that they are actually looking at the genomes of people across the world in nine to 10 seconds for entire populations. It used to take one PhD graduate four years to map out a single genome of an individual. So medicine as we know it for the youth in the room is going to change dramatically and this is, I firmly believe, a coupling effect of self-monitoring, mobilize uh, wireless devices, mobile phones, iPads, whatever, and a very significant drive by the patients to understand how they can motivate themselves to better health care. But the but I'd like to talk about is the natural desire to continue to talk to people around them, either in social media or experts that they seek their advice from. We know, and we'll talk later, about the very difficult problem with provincial budgets. We're in significant deficits. Uh, we are in no different than Europe and all struggling with what to spend money on. Um, you can't blame the docs. We are not overpopulated with physicians in this country. Uh, we're ranking uh, quite low, uh, 2.4 per thousand. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we need more doctors, but it is not a doctor-pop uh, ratio problem, in my opinion. The other big and very interesting fact that we'll just touch on at a high level is that 5% of our patients are costing us 65% of health care costs. Uh, whether you lump this in chronic disease, whether you lump this with aging populations or people who are passing uh, the last six months of their life in the hospital sector, it's uh, very difficult to know, but it still remains a big problem. And I'd like to pose a question to you that Bill Pascal has asked me. What if you gave all these people wireless devices plans and people to talk to them and coach them. And I'm not talking about regulated professions. It could be personal support workers. The other most exciting thing that happened to me in my career about 10 years ago is when I was able to see the PAC system for radiology for all of Northern Ontario and experience the NEON system that interconnected all our hospitals. This was fantastic to go to the emergency room and look up all of the drugs that were prescribed for people on ODB or over 65. It was terrific to see reports, echocardiograms, and discharge summaries. And then I had this wonderful experience of leaving the hospital, and I became a non-institutional provider. I've always been an advocate for primary form, team-based care, and all my communication with this world stopped. 
For those of us, we understand the electronic health record use. Certainly, uh, there's been significant trends in availability of labs. Now that I have an EMR and I'm a non-institutional provider, the lab data comes quite nicely and I see it. I have a way now of looking back and seeing PACs and discharge summaries. Generally, they arrive eight to 10 days after uh, the posting and paper by the courier. EMR integration. I'd just like to touch on EMR integration. There are 70 plus EMRs in Canada. Uh, about 50% of physicians have adopted them. There's still 50% of physicians who are not, and there's a growing movement to say they're legacy systems. They're nothing but uh, basically Excel spreadsheets with organized data that we can't mine, we can't use, and we can't pull out all our diabetic patients or people who are taking metformin. Uh, similarly, met these EMRs are not giving a lot of physicians confidence, and as you well know, some of them have not sustained viability, and it's been very difficult for billing. So another thing to think about are what are the technology enablers that are going to impact health? And this is a global trend and it is considered by most governments to be the reality. The first is cloud computing. This will take our cost per capita for data storage down to pennies per user per year. Mobile commuting, uh, 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 mobile computing I would say inv involves all of uh, desks not desktops, tablets, and devices that you uh, are a company to work now. And you'll see a big trend in the industry that people bring their own devices and companies are no longer um, limiting that opportunity. The devices are ubiquitous, they're agile, and they're replacing the desktop at a rate of 66% per year. We have consumer enablement and big data analytics. And big data analytics and relational data is uh, very, very interesting. Probably the most advances in Cambridge in the UK. So I'm just gonna to touch a little bit on mobile computing. We know that 62% of primary care physicians have uh, phones, and I'd just like to let you read that data and reflect that in my group, my retiring physician partner got his first iPhone when he could actually look up all the wines in the LCBO, and he could, <laughs> basically find which wine stores was carrying his favorite Chablis. We had no power getting him on, but as soon as he got that phone, he then had Hippocrates and we could involve him in the call schedule. Similarly, consumer engagement, and it's, it's a well-known fact that these come and go, and WebMD is, is now undergoing some transformative change, but patients like me and messaging and talking to each other with similar diseases have transformed the healthcare. My dearest and best friend died of a hypernephroma kidney cancer. She was a well-known geneticist, pediatric specialist in Boston. She lived on patients like me. It's where she found out the best options for her treatment. And data analytics, and we've heard this morning that the robustness of the computers and predictability probably rests with the UK and Cambridge. I was very disheartened to read InfoCom at 5 a.m. this morning to learn yet again another large study confirmed that there's very little point for GPs screening diabetics, that in fact, screening of diabetics does not improve mortality or outcome, uh, reduce heart attacks, or even change cancer rates. So why are we here today? We're here to talk about the integration of the system with mobility and EHRs. And really, the, hu the hub of the discussion today now, which I'll give you case examples and personal experience, is about secure messaging and how that can enable patients and better outcomes, how they must integrate into EMRs and data repositories that are previously built to complement our outcomes. And I think that the opportunity is exciting and has completely reinvigorated an old GP after 30 years. And let me tell you, if a blonde can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> So there's a very good report that you should review um, uh, by the Health Council of Canada that was released yesterday and they were good enough to show us some data before the talk today. It's disappointing that 2006 and 2012 that we haven't made a lot of progress in primary care despite enormous eff efforts and investment. But still what's at the very bottom corner that I want to point out to you is that we have a big gap that we can address with mobility. And that's an ability to remind patients to come back to the office or follow up with test results and not get lost to follow up. So what do patients want? There's always a conflict. Patients want restoring health, timeliness and kindness and a lot of time in the office from any provider. They don't get any of that in the encounter. They have decreased access. And really the government's huge problem we saw earlier is that the costs are rising and they're not getting better outcomes. 
So what I'm proposing to you is that if we take the simplicity of mobility, couple it with the immediacy of the question in real time, make it secure and seamless, put it in cloud computing, address cost containment and reduce the cost, I believe that you could get improved access and a tremendous market opportunity for public-private partnerships. And just to touch on the healthcare system in Ontario, we are no small entity. We have 211 hospitals, 13,000 physicians, a huge per capita annual expenditure that's growing, and this is, you know, ahead of Coca-Cola, Lockwood, Martin, and Cisco, and hence the connection back to the Coke commercial. Again, in 1980, when we talked about influences on healthcare costs, it used to be just four things, drugs and doctors. Now it's rising costs all over, aging populations, childless people who are not looking after seniors, rapidly changing technology, escalating costs of chronic disease because we've done a good job now. Cancer lasts seven years, you don't last seven months. And there's really no interest in the population in compromising equity. And dying at home is very expensive. So Ontario, I think, has come up with a very good and solid vision of health links. And they do believe, through technology, that we should collaborate. We should involve all stakeholders. We should have patients involved. We should use information technology to its maximum. We should aim to improve outcomes and manage complex care disease a little bit differently. But there's a man in here whose name is Don Finn, who's also profoundly influenced me over the last year. And family caregivers represent, Don, I hope I've got this right, 70 million individuals. Seven million, seven million, thank you. I've just added a zero because it feels very large in my practice. <laughs> Anecdotally, every second patient comes in with a daughter or a son upset about a parent who's generally suffering from mental illness, dementia, or poverty that's affecting the ability of this person to take care of themselves every second encounter. It takes a tremendous amount of time, and these individuals, the Family Caregivers of Canada, are devoted to improving outcomes, helping sustainability, reducing our cost per capita, reducing emergency room visits, and reducing hospital stays. They must be involved in the future. Forbes recently, in October of this year, put forward a business case for the modern patient portal. Again, they've pointed out to us that 1% of the spending has been spent on the patient. It's all being spent on institutional, top-down. We'll talk more about this. I would just like to leave you with this thought. None of you would go on a diet, I expect, if you didn't have a set of weigh scales that you could use every second day to test whether or not the diet was working. This is the type of feedback patients expect. 1980, the determinants of health were about sewer, water, and roof over your head. Now they've changed. It's very important to know that 20% of healthcare is delivering the determinants of health. 10% is genetics. 40% is behavior management. <coughs> Mobile phones are ubiquitous. The yellow represents one to one, one phone per patient. The orange represents one and a half po uh, phones per individual in Pakistan. The red is 200%. And the, the country that has 200% is none other than Israel. Every other industry has managed to figure this out, whether you're iTunes, whether you're Blockbuster, uh, sorry, I now moved to Netflix, whether you're Amazon, whether you're uh, ordering, <coughs> uh, sending messages to your friends now as opposed to sending cards. Healthcare is the one that has not figured out the billion dollar opportunity. To what, what does a text or what does an email actually mean to you? And I just wanted to say, I'm going to make a plea for healthcare to use security. General Petraeus is the best example of what email can do to your career. <laughs> sending an email is no different than sending it on a postcard. It's stored in servers. It's stored uh, where people can uh, look at it for up to 10 to 15 years. It can be misinterpreted. It can be altered. There can be innuendos from that. It's a very dangerous thing to think that as you sit there in the privacy of your home using Dr. Graham at Vianet that all the information that you're sending is private. I would really urge you to look at secure messaging uh, uh, aspects and consider the privacy security uh, path. Uh, and, and I'm particularly uh, an advocate of Dr. Kavukian's privacy by design. So valuing time saved. This is an important document that's being uh, produced by the Conference Board of Canada. And it's very, very important to see that the public 
one in two people want to save time, want better outcome, and want information generally about lab tests. And this affects their work and productivity. For example, if you have two young people who have a four-year-old that needs to see the family physician, if one of them could message in the morning, get an appointment by nine, the other can go to work, baby can be seen early, and be dropped off at grandma so that there is only a half day loss of work. Doctors want evidence. The evidence abounds in messaging, particularly for the management of diabetes. Whether it's WellDoc out of Boston, Kaiser Permanente, or the military, or the AARP, patient engagement and continuing messaging is not overburdening for the patient and can reduce blood pressures, A1Cs, and LDLs to, stati to statistically significant numbers. So what's this all about? And this is my concept of point of care with mobility. The first and most important part, rather than having your symptoms and your experiences interpreted, they are actually received and made part of the SOAP note. No one needs to tell you how you feel. You're pretty good at telling us how you feel and how bad the weekend was and where you went and what emergency physicians you saw. The second is the ability to keep with you and discuss terrifically difficult reports that sometimes are very hard to understand and that you really want to take home and study. You want to know what an ejection fracture is. By the way, the new driver's licenses require you to have the ejection fracture on and every patient comes in and says, what is this? The third component is that ability to manage your case on an ongoing basis in real time. So if there's slight adjustments that you need to make to your asthma medication, and this is the Canadian Asthma Case Management, this is great to be able to talk to the respiratory technology or make some alterations or order the Ventolin that you threw in the garbage by accident. And finally, with this ongoing case management is your ability to co-manage multiple diseases. When I started chronic disease management, I made file systems for COPD, diabetes, mellitus, um, arthritis, osteoporosis, and so my patients were all uh, organized. And my staff came in one day and said, Dr. Graham, you've got the same patient in all those categories. Can we combine them? It was an epiphany moment for me because it is not about the disease, it's about the patient. The argument can be made from every sector that secure messaging, ongoing coaching is a real benefit whether you're in the Canadian economy and restoring $408 million per annum, if we actually did something by July of this year, we could have saved a billion dollars in health care minus the cost of implementing. For the, for the family practice, at best they will, they will be cost neutral. Most of them, I predict, will make 18% or more in their revenue. They will mitigate risk. Four to one, they'll get in touch with patients and they will have happier staff. For the patient, it is clear from the research done by PricewaterhouseCoopers, they want real-time outcomes, they don't want to waste time sitting in eMERGE or trying to get in touch with a physician or waiting 17 minutes on the phone, and they don't want to spend the money that they know is unnecessary reaching that, that important question. And finally, the system. I will predict that there will be a slow transformative change that will eventually move to a viral uptake because all of us will decide it's the easy and the right thing to do and we need to address costs. A frustrated member of the Lynn wrote to me and said he has Crohn's disease and he really is tired of driving to Mount Sinai from Ottawa when he could have discussed this online with a video conference. Similarly, what do patients do? And our initial data shows that patients are very reasonable. The top green graphs show that doctors push, patients receive, and about 30% of them do bi-directional discussion. So one in three are asking, and they're asking about three things, LDLs, pregnancy tests, and an important lab result, sometimes about appointments. GPs do a tremendous amount of system management. Where's the referral? What do I do to prepare? Where's the CD for my MRI? Can I drive to the barium enema? All of this type of stuff is done tremendously by the GP's office and primarily. What patients do is they document the thing they're most afraid of is being treated in the emergency room for, with a drug that they're allergic to. So they carry in their personal health record evidence of their allergies, chronic disease, and medication. They're up to date. They want to be real. And of course, usage is sporadic. It's, it's seasonal. We know all of this. Sometimes heavy use on Monday and Wednesday, very quiet on Friday. People over 60, so over 50 or 60% of the participants, women still run the world. They make the appointments, they ask the question, they bring in the children, and they bring in the parents. Uh, again, an 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of people are doing their messaging at home thoughtfully, looking, Googling their disease. 20% are actually in an acute situation, Googling on their phones. 80% are Apple, 20% make up the rest of the phone use. 
So a little use case that's kind of fun. Social media drives direction in the UK. And the stat that I love in this is 22% of the adults are using their phones in the washroom and 40%, 47% of the teenagers are using their phones in the washroom. They're totally addicted. Now, we proposed that we could use social media and we could help people uh, self-identify if they had an STD. Now, the research suggests that if you message people directly and say, use a condom so you don't get an STD, there's no impact on the outcome. So what we did is we Facebooked in the area of London proper, 100 kilometers, people between the ages of 15 and 24. We asked the UK government to give us six months to identify 2% positive. We identified the 2% positive in nine weeks. The last positive was actually in the Ukraine. And what people did was get the Facebook, that we asked them, do you know one day you may be infertile? Women, again, more than men answered it. They downloaded the My Health app. We mailed them in the snail mail a cup to pee in to test for chlamydia. They mailed it back. And we got our 2% positive in nine weeks. And these people would not have otherwise gone to the doctor. They were thinking alone at night about their worry. This is a new population at risk. The reason that chlamydia matters to government is because of the out-extended costs. These are the infertility, these are the people that get married, these are the um, mistake nights that we all have, and in the end you have IVF, you're at risk for uterine cancer, you're at risk for breast cancer, you have depression, you don't have the children that you want in your life. The repercussions of a single incident are tremendous. It's treatable with one dose of antibiotics. So the UK has started on the, on the uh, self-identified population and their emphasis will be mental health and sexual health and they're doing a tremendous project uh, uh, on dementia because dementia is 1% of the GDP. And the last thing that I will touch on again with respect to social media, just to caution, that many, many people have documented many, many times that in their attempt to have good communication with their friends, uh, they have inadvertently let a secret out that's caused them very serious harm. When people are ready to talk about something, I think uh, they're definitely ready. But most of the time in my office today, they still lean in the window, they close the glass doors, they come around, they close the door, they want to remain private in their health care. And as a parting request, I still think that we have to consider when we move forward into this new arena to think very carefully about our TRAs, our PIAs, and how we address privacy, security, and standards. So that's the conclusion of my talk today because I'd like to leave an opportunity for questions. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just move away. Great. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone, and thank you, thank you, Wendy, for, for a great talk. Um, I'm just gonna, I've just got about um, seven brief uh, <clears throat> reflections and questions, and I'm gonna finish on a few thoughts about happiness. So, one of the great experiences about this meeting was working with uh, Wendy, and after it was announced, leaders in primary care and healthcare policy across Canada. Um, through email, social media, would approach me and Wendy, and, and they'd offer diverse and constructive ideas for our talk. And I immediately learned what many people already know about Wendy, and that's uh, she's someone uh, whom eclectic, diverse people, and people from international business, uh, government, patient, caregiver communities, from Toronto to North Bay, um, <clears throat> approach her in a very approachable manner. And that, and that is, 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 is incredible about, about this. It's just not only practitioners, but also people who are thinking about how to improve primary care are very collaborative. And so in thinking about Wendy's presentation on the future of primary care, I have a few thoughts and questions for all of us that are a blend of concerns I've heard um, and thought about uh, as a patient, as a taxpayer, as an entrepreneur, as a business investor, as a, as, as a researcher. So first, very concretely, um, from the perspective of men, uh, mental health, a major uh, cost and human health challenge. How can primary care physicians who allot relatively little uh, time to each patient ever discern mental health problems unless the patients volunteer them? So even if the patient does volunteer them and does feel empowered, which isn't always the case, there's no time to appropriately respond in a way that makes pe uh, the patient necessarily feel listened to or understood. And the, and the primary care physician, as I understand it, has basically three options. Um, the first is come back and see me and we'll discuss this, this further for another brief period of time. 
And probably the best response, as I understand it, uh, is to be seen quickly and, uh, again, if the patient is amenable to being seen. But what we know from the Health Council of Canada data uh, is that that's tricky and it often depends on, on your location. Uh, the second option is, you know, try this antidepressant or anti-anxiety agent. Uh, choosing the right one at the right dose isn't easy and drugs may not be indicated. Or the third, I'll refer you to a psychologist, maybe not, not covered by OHIP, and the primary care physician is not likely to know many, or a psychiatrist. There's a very long wait time, and then it's only a one-time consultation. So that's my first reflection and thought. The second is from the cost context. So what, if anything, can be done to bring unsustainable healthcare spending growth under control without sacrificing patient care and care quality. Um, the business and policy climate that I see in Ontario is that we've jumped off the fiscal cliff, we've been bungee jumping for a few years, and most of us are too afraid to admit that we've actually snapped the cord. We're broke. And the third is from the activated patient and caregiver context. And this is hot off the press, Healthcare of, of Canada uh, data. It's a rich report, um, but looking to the future of primary care, there's an interesting data point that speaks to the evolution of primary care around the, uh, around the world. It's a timely topic. Uh, in Canada, apparently just one quarter uh, of primary care physicians say they could easily generate a list of patients who are due for a test or preventive care, such as the annual flu vaccine, and, and Canada ranks nine out of 10 countries. And people debate incentives, the role of EMRs, but I'd like to ask you to consider a more fundamental question about these trends and how they will change. And that is this, you know, to what extent will mandated policies at the institutional or provincial level improve our numbers? What's more powerful, bottom-up demand or the power, uh, or, or the power of the state uh, within a context of very weakened economic influence? Fourth reflection. Technology innovation, and we've heard a lot about that today from Wendy. And in light of three technological drivers of healthcare deliver, uh, delivery in the future, uh, genetic and personalized medicine, Eric Topol's book, if you haven't read it, highly recommend it, um, remote healthcare delivery and monitoring, uh, ambulatory surgery clinics, how should the role of primary doctors evolve? Fifth, from a business model innovation, should the primary health care paradigm itself evolve and take the family health care team concept to the next level by creating a kind of one-stop health facility where in addition to primary health care docs, there are also facilities for the most common diagnostic imaging techniques like x-rays and ultrasounds, uh, specialty and surgical services. Sixth, uh, incentives for innovation adoption. So if you look, for example, at the use of smartphones for diagnostic imaging, uh, should new fee codes uh, be introduced to incent docs to adopt these technologies? Um, at what point, at what point does the adoption and purchase of new and emerging technologies become the responsibility of the doctors, or should the healthcare system create the financial incentives for the adoption of these new and innovative technologies? And then, seventh, and probably, you know, most important, and this, I've been influenced by the Healthcare of Canada data on this. From the perspective of workplace health, rates, this is incredible to me, rates of job satisfaction for physicians are really high, um, on par with other countries, uh, basically around 80%. Um, I originally uh, was trained as a lawyer, and uh, basically I now, in a business capacity, I, I work with a ton of lawyers, and I'd say that job satisfaction is probably around 8%. Um, so the question then is, to what extent, and I'll, I'll leave on this, and then Anton, you can Q&A, um, to what extent is the role of the family physician going to change such that they're even happier? Because uh, the thesis I want to put forward is that basically happier primary care providers uh, mean happier patients. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Wendy, could you take a minute and describe your practice so that we understand what you do every day? <laughs> well, I've undergone tumultuous change. Um, I formerly was the first wave of family health teams with way back with George Smitherman. Uh, we're the first rural family health team. 
and so we cobbled together about 17 physicians and we were 100% hospitalist and we had about 22,000 patients we were caring for and uh, then um, following an opportunity I left that practice um, to begin discussions around the mobility of healthcare and the extension and reform of primary care. So that transformation occurred in the last 18 months and I really thought, uh, so I have a crazy life, I work Saturdays and Sundays I do my nursing home and I have an open door concept, first come first door, through the door. Um, I thought all the patients would, would go elsewhere but they haven't. Um, now it's difficult because I don't have the after hour care. I have a marathon Monday as well and I do house calls on Sunday. Uh, so that's the practice and then every second Friday I go back and do Friday Saturday because I love my practice and I love the aging population. The practice I inherited was 35 years old so now I have that subpart of the Coke guys that are still living independently. So as a result of that we, um, we have uh, a nurse practitioner at a personal support worker and a nurse that stay in the office full time. We answer the phones over lunch, so we open at 8.30 and we stay until 5. And so far, we are managing to keep our acute care visits in the emergency uh, to just the, th the four to fives, the frustrated ones. Most of the acute care has intervened, and I think we've been able to reduce our hospital admissions for the aging population quite a bit because we do, on average, uh, between us all four, about four house calls a day. So when I'm not there, the nurse or the RPN goes. And everything from syringing ears to just listening to you know, uh, chest pain that they don't want to sit and emerge for nine hours for. So that's, that's the practice, very, very different. My biggest lesson in life is those not connected to an institution suffer. They, you suffer with your patients and you suffer as a provider. Um, I had the privilege of calling a hospital as a non-institutional provider because I have a associate privileges now and I was told to fax and proof of my credentials and that my request for the patient's information would be sent to me in, in order with the faxes have been received at the hospital. The person had acute gallbladder disease and it was a terrible experience. I still don't have it. I, call, I called in November. I still don't have the results. So you're not connected and you need to get connected. So, so when you're not in the office, how often are you on your iPhone? A lot. Um, we <laughs> 11 o'clock last night answering two questions. Um, so uh, we, we have a system where we've told the patients that we don't answer the phones except during office hours, but people compose their messages and send them in. And uh, the gallbladder attack actually came in over New Year's Eve. The person wrote about his daughter who, um, he heads the laundry services for Northern Ontario, all the hospitals, and his daughter was really, really ill and not getting um, access to the care she needed because she was upset in the emergency room and she was rude. And so it really went backwards for her. Then she had an anaphylactic reaction to the morphine Statex she was given and she got ruder and rashes. <laughs> And he was beside himself, and I got a picture of the rash and the whole long explanation. And other physicians that are using the system will tell you, and I was quite horrified at one of the messages from one of the patients, but what the, what the doctor told me was that it was really good to have all this documented because when the patient came, they were prepared and they were able to organize the test requests and they were able to feel that the patient had expressed herself and it was documented properly uh, as opposed to getting cut off, getting her interview shortened. She really had all of the things she wanted to say on the record. And that, that is the epiphany that you have, actually letting people write what they want and say what they want and read what they have to say. It's very important. It it's transformative because you've, you've read it. And you can do it faster. There's a stat, 50% of encounters with docs are the nice talk, right? You know, how's the dog? What happened to the toothbrush? And then you get down to the nitty gritty. But a lot of this is summarized and it's much more satisfying in, in the encounter because the business is executed properly. Then there's time for the nice talk and you know people are satisfied. And back to the iPhone, how do you get paid when you're doing it on the iPhone? Well, if I could take a crack at Neil's really good question because I thought a lot about this. Um, when I implemented electronic medical records, the government did a great job incentivizing me, although you know there wasn't enough money to go around and you got the lottery first. That incentive is very important. Um, doctors need a big carrot and a bigger stick to make them change because they're so busy, it's hard. So I think physicians will, must be responsible for the purchases of their own devices, much like business is. But I do hope that there is a very wise decision to incentivize them with, with e-codes, I'll call them. What I personally think would work the best is some type of quarterly fund 
of a large amount, five to $7,000, to prove that X number of patients were managed for X situation and there was a performance target of uh, at least measuring whether or not people intended to go to the emergency room or did go to the emergency room or it enhanced house calls or some type of intervention there. I don't think we know enough about this, but I do think you have to incentivize paying the physician, but let them purchase their own devices, manage their own workflow, and hire their own staff that are receptive to this this type of communication. And not all staff are receptive. And the same thing happened with EMRs. We, we had to fire people to introduce EMRs because some people just didn't want to do them. So it's up to the floor to ask any more questions. Alex, what are you, you guffawed at one point. What was that about? <laughs> Is that an aging problem? Exactly. <laughs> I know how you feel. Was his book actually reviewed? Did he send it for review to the C to the Canadian Medical Association? It seems extremely important topic. I'm sorry, uh, which well, did I've, you send your I've, book I've, I've written review to the Canadian Medical Association because sure, I've written four. Which book? Is the book utmost importance. Uh, uh, sorry, my most recent book. Use, use the mic, uh, Neil, would you? The XXL. Uh, um, uh, thank you. More recent one than that. Uh, 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 there is one forthcoming. I can't reveal the topic. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, no, uh, with respect to that book, uh, the short answer is I, uh, I don't believe it was. Uh, it has been reviewed. You can Google it. Uh, frankly, it was, the number of reviews was uh, thanks to Michelle Obama. Um, uh, it just rode a wave of, of, uh, of, uh, of influence. And uh, I think uh, capitalizing on much of the great work uh, of Anton's group uh, from the Canadian Obesity Network of which I'm on the board, um, uh, focusing, it's actually a book about mental health. It's not, it's not a book about obesity, that's the irony. Um, uh, which I realized, uh, mental health is my area of philanthropy. I fell into obesity uh, by that. And essentially, uh, I realized that, uh, that uh, the importance of uh, stigmatizing the obese has to be addressed uh, considerably. So. What's the book called on um, mental health? Uh, I've written two. They're both uh, uh, basically popular, uh, popularizing my parents. My parents are neuroscientists. Uh, one is called Psyche in the Lab, and uh, one is called uh, Celebrating uh, Brain Science in Canada. So Neil and I appreciate the ad for Coke at the beginning, uh, both of us being involved with the obesity organization, Wendy. <laughs> actually, um, we actually collaborate with Coke hoping that they'll invest some really good money into obesity, and they appear to be listening. All right, who's got some more questions? Here we go. I'm going to pass the mic to you, right? Then we can all hear it. Could you pass it along in one back? Hi, I have a question in regards to what both of you think of the statistic you gave that 80% of physicians were happy when we have a system that you have said is broken. I wondered what your reflections were on that statistic. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. That's a great. I mean, it's a great question. It's a fascinating question. Um, the short answer is I don't know. But um, uh, and I'm I'm going to cite Staney, who may be in the audience here. I'm not sure. But the point is is um, that I've learned is that people who go into healthcare, I think, just are incredibly passionate about it. And I would assume that that's that's uh, that's obviously reflective because it's a cross country comparison. You see it across countries. It continues over time. Um, and uh, so I think there's a, there's a motivation and a sense of, of optimism in the context of maybe financial despair. So I think that that encodes it because it's such a consistent statistic. If it changed, if it was volatile, um, I would try to look for some other explanation. But that's my personal theory. But I, I'm sure there's, there's some others. I'm sure if you ask them maybe more granular questions <laughs> um, about uh, incentives or whomever, I, I think maybe the, the statistic may, may change. You want to add to that, Wendy? I would. I would could you would, grab uh, the mic too, Wendy, please? So I think I've got this. Uh, I, I would uh, answer the question somewhat differently if I could. I think that your productivity cycles as a physician change. And I think that they're gender specific. Uh, 
And I think for many women, when they start in practice, they start at part time and they're still doing family responsibilities or they have special interests as, as women. And then as they get older, their productivity in administrative areas and uh, I'm just seeing more patients really improves, you know, around 45 to 50. And I think you see this reverse cycle with men. I mean, I think they work often very, very hard. And now we're seeing yet another transformative change in this generation, uh, physicians that have a better work ethic and balance. So I can certainly say that the young physicians that I've met are tremendously passionate and very happy, and they're not talking about leaving the profession. They're worried about what city they're going to settle in and how they have a family. Um, I think the statistics on primary care have improved because of tremendous effort uh, on behalf of government and universities to show the, the value of primary care, which wasn't so obvious. And I think the sad part of the profession, the 20%, is the tertiary specialty. Uh, the, the orthopedic surgeon that's done an extra year in hand surgery cannot get a job in this province. And I can't access a hand surgeon in Northern Ontario. So really, we have to look at, at the profession from a, a total spectrum. Any other questions for either of these people? Then let me do a little promotion. First of all, I got to thank IBM, and I especially have to thank Accenture because they're not up there. IBM got a little extra advertising, but they do. They pay for the coffee, they pay for the drinks, they pay for the work we put into it, and um, we appreciate their support. So our next session will be uh, Dr. Lee Sachs from Advocate Health. We're going to start bringing up some people from out of the country over the, uh, over the next season, and he uh, will be the first one. So look for that. You'll get a notice in your email. And thank you for coming to Breakfast with the Chiefs.